Hi, I'm David DeGraff. I'm an astronomer and science fiction writer at Alfred University in Alfred, New York. And I've got two classes where I deal with aliens. Um, science and science fiction, which I've been teaching since the mid 90s, and life in the universe, which I started teaching early in this century. Um, and in those classes, I have a project where the students design their own aliens. What I want them to do is use the principles of evolution, um, inheriting things from a common ancestor, as well as the notions of convergent evolution, um, and use those to produce a realistic alien. Convergent evolution is probably the thing that's going to tell us the most about what makes an alien realistic or not realistic. Um, and I want them to be able to recognize the products of convergent evolution, as well as recognize what is inherited from a common ancestor. Um, the science fiction class, the emphasis is more on how the alien biology affects the culture. And Julie Chernada is amazing at doing that. Her older series, uh, Beholder's Eye, um, from the 90s worked well, but I've got a rule of, that I mostly follow of not using um, stories written before the students were born. Um, so fortunately, she started up a second series with that um, shape-shifting alien ca character um, from Beholder's Eye uh, in Search Image, and there's a, the second one is just out this year. But she also has survival, which involves a scientist. So we get to see scientists in action, and they get to realize, the students get to realize that science is, a, is an exciting endeavor that's not just all memorizing stuff. Um, and showing the creative side of, of science is definitely something I want to do in my classes. Um, I also use some Neti Okorafor. Um, we've got Binti, uh, which is a novella um, that's got some very unusual aliens in it. And LaGuardia is a graphic novel that has um, sentient plants in it. Um, and Semiosis by Sue Burke also has sentient plants. Um, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so what I do is I give the students uh, two or three different planets. I mix them up um, so it's not the same ones every year. But we've got a planet that's uh, tight around an M dwarf. So it's tidally locked to its host star. And the life is going to be in the crepuscular zone, the twilight zone. Um, and I'll give them a super Earth, which is going to have stronger gravity than Earth has. Or I'll give them a planet with a high obliquity, so the seasons are really strong, so there's an opportunity for migration. And then I'll throw a wrench in that by putting a planet that's in a very elliptical orbit, uh, so that the whole planet goes out of the habitable zone in the winter time. Um, <clears throat> so migration is not an option for that. I'm a little bit wary of doing that one because seasons are not on earth or not caused by varying the distance from the sun but um since it's making migration not an option that um goes a little bit uh, longer towards that um so i want them to use convergent evolution in a realistic way while they're coming up with their aliens. And this first example of what they've got is one that I use as a don't do this type thing. In the detail in this skeleton, if you just is, um, is outstanding. And if you just look at the picture of the aliens, like, yeah, that's kind of okay. But the skeleton showing that it's that that's, that's, um, that's a terrestrial animal that's gone back to the ocean. Um, and there, there's a couple things that make this a bad alien. The skeleton's exactly like a mammal. 
or maybe a reptile. Um, but it's a vertebrate on Earth with all the same features that vertebrae on Earth has. So that's one strike against it. The other strike against it is that all the other aquatic animals that have um, started off as terrestrial animals and moved back to the ocean, that's one thing that's going to show up over and over again. Um, it's happened over and over again on Earth. It'll probably happen over and over again on the alien planets. It's like, hey, water's a good place to get food. Um, it happened with uh, the reptiles in the age of the dinosaurs. It happened with birds and penguins. It happened with mammals uh, twice. We've got the pinnipeds as well as the cetaceans. Um, <clears throat> slightly different versions of that. Um, but every time it did, the hind legs merged into a single limb. Um, so that's probably going to be something that shows up across uh, the aliens that we look at, there's, when they go back into the water, the legs, if there are hind limbs, they're going to merge into a single thing. Um, so I had this student merge limbs in a different way. The hind limbs merged with the forelimbs to create this and a common ancestor to each of these three different, um, creatures, um, and there is the aquatic version of it, the aerial version of it, as well as the terrestrial version. Um, I don't know why they picked to call this the Elvis. Um, but the skeleton is clearly not something that is related to a creature on Earth. So we've got some stuff and we've got um, common ancestors showing that the different, the converged limbs. And we also have um, convergent evolution with um, aquatic, aerial, and terrestrial adaptations. Um, so here is one that's convergent evolution is showing that we have, there's, there's two ways convergent evolution shows up. In this one, we give the ray which is um, something, a pattern that's happened several times in, uh, for, for aquatic life on Earth. But instead of being derived from a worm with a mouth on one end and an anus on the other, this is more like um, the jellyfish and the uh, coral where the stomach comes out, grabs the prey, brings it in, digests it and then expels it out the same way it came in, stomach like lungs instead of like what we have. Um, so that uh, I encourage their mixing and matching of different things when they're trying to come up with some realistic aliens. <clears throat> um, why do we have to have four legs for things on the earth? There may be a reason for that. Um, four legs may be more efficient for walking on land for larger creatures, but that may be something that's related to common ancestors. Um, so I, I encourage them to come up with different numbers of limbs. So we've got this six limbed guy here. Um, Unicorn, we've got the adult and the juvenile version. Um, and here's another example of a six-limbed creature. And um, so we have a common ancestor between these two species. Um, we have the six-legged um, hexapedal um, creatures. And then we've got quadrupeds, where they've um, had an alteration in their past um, where their front limbs became um, freestanding from the ground and became manipulators. Um, 
So we have that convergent thing with what, uh, what happened for humans when we started walking upright and also happened in the um, marsupials with the kangaroo line and with the um, with dinosaurs and the um, the upright dinosaurs with the grasping hands um, one line got to the grasping hands one line got to birds um, so there, there's something that's happened over and over again she's the this was a group that did this um, and the common ancestor also had three eyes and a vertical mouth instead of a horizontal mouth. And we've got shifting eye placement, um, which, is, which was a fantastic feature on this one. So this, these students have gotten, um, used convergent evolution and common ancestor principles and come up with something really good. This one is, I was really sad when this one fell apart. Um, these tubes go into here and then come up together on the tennis ball with its four googly eyes. The mouth of this creature is on the bottom and it could use these two of the tubes are um, nutrition, um, blood, and I forget what the fourth one was, third one was. They had three different sets of stuff going in. Um, it's, oh, it's food, yeah. Um, food, oxygen, uh, I forget what they are. And these other two clear ones are muscles. So they can squat down and jump up and hop from place to place and their mouth is on the bottom like a squid has. Um, and and this this was just a fun one to to look at and the student definitely had fun with doing this um so on the planet that has the highly elliptical orbit this student came up with a really cool adaptation of having hair that acts as an insulator for the winter but then when it's warm the hair stiffens and spikes out and their circulation that increases while it's in this erectile state, uh, when it's in this extended state, and it acts as a cooling fan, um, cooling source. Um, so there, there was something cool that came up with that. And then we've got this uh, adaptation of burying themselves in the ground to deal with the cold, which is something similar to what we have on Earth. So by making aliens for my different classes, I've got showing the creative side of science. That is the most important thing I want to do. Science is a creative endeavor. Um, and so they're coming up with hypotheses of what alien life might be like, what a realistic alien might look at. And they're using the principles of evolution, both common ancestors and convergent evolution um, in coming up with their models. So that's what I am doing in my classes. And um, I think that's working out pretty well. If I am not over my time limit, I'm just going to mention um, what was the thing I was going to mention? Um, if I'm not going over my time limit, I'm going to mention that um, in the science fiction class, I've been moving the emphasis more towards how the biology affects the culture. So first they come up with the principles, um, use convergent evolution and common ancestors, come up with some cool aliens, a set of aliens, and then, you know, a whole ecosystem. And then use the biology to affect culture. Um, mostly that involves mating, but um, it doesn't have to. So those are the things that I do in the class. Thank you.